I was so sink line hook into this animal product bad that that I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it clearly. Um, so I started to get challenged though by professors quite early on about things like that and uh, you know benefits of eggs and like okay so why won't you eat eggs? You could have your own chickens. There's no harm done. It's you know it's not a fertilized egg. And I started to make peace with being open to some of those concepts. And then I started learning about biodynamic farming. And my husband was farming, like I said, at Full Circle, an organic farm, and I was doing their farmer's market. And I started to really understand not just how animals could support agriculture, but how animals are essential to agriculture. And that really helped me to be like, whoa, you know, so actually when the chickens follow the ruminants, you know, and that, that ruminant is the best plow out there. And you're saying we don't have to use fossil fuel or corn derived ethanol um, to fuel a tractor if we have these animals in the, or to the level of, right? Um, and so I think that when you understand sustainably, the, the depths of sustainability relies on that diversity of the ecosystem. And I think that that necessitates an omnivore approach. What's up guys, welcome back to another show brought to you by our friends over at helloned.com. The leaders in a hemp derived CBD formula that's biodynamically grown on the western slope of Colorado. Now here's what makes Ned different from all the other, the plethora of other CBD products out there. Number one, there's nothing coming from China. A lot of CBD companies are just buying bulk material, they're buying the roots, the tubers, the leaves, and who knows what other part of the plant that was utilizing solvents like benzene and toluene to extract the CBD. And here's what's unique, again, to contrast what's out there compared to what Ned offers. This biodynamically grown hemp derived CBD is using a cold ethanol extraction. There's no benzene, there's no toluene, there's no caustic uh, you know, solvents and things like that. They're very transparent. On their website, every lot has links to pesticides that are found in the, in the formula, which there are none, and, and the C of A of the uh, third party test of the solvents and other things that are in the product, which by the way, there are none. So there's transparency, there's honesty, and there's very low levels of THC. So if you're worried about enhancing your sleep, but you're like, wait, there's could be THC in here. My you know employer tests for this. Need not worry. There's 0.03% in there or less. So you can save on your next order. And here's how I personally recommend it, by the way, for enhancing sleep, which there's a lot of indications here. And later in the podcast, Ali's going to talk about her CBD coconut oil, like fat bombs that are really amazing. We've made them in our house. So you can save on your next order by going to helloned.com forward slash HIH. I'll put a little code here and also link in the description if you forget that. But again, one more time, that URL is helloned.com forward slash HIH15 to save 15% off your next order. Let's cut back to it with Allie. So Danny kept talking about the food that you had at your event before KetoCon yeah. and made me so like the stuff. I mean, can you, we just can start there because I know food's kind of a cornerstone or it is a cornerstone of your, your clinical practice and what you preach on social media. And he started telling me about the entree, the appetizer, the dessert. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'd never even heard of some of this stuff. So yeah. And you got an invite, man. I so. know. I know. <laughs> it was just, fair. it was hard because yeah, Redmond Real Salt had an event. Right. We already committed to that. So right. I, I really missed out. But yeah. What would you? So I partnered with CrowdCow for that event and uh, helped them to source all Texas food from snout to tail as far as the proteins. So we had a liver pate with crudite of seasonal vegetables like watermelon radish and heirloom carrot and uh, you know cucumber and a bunch of other random stuff. And then we had uh, kidney meatballs, grass-fed kidney meatballs. And they actually didn't even have to do a blend because of the flavor profile. We had a lot of fresh herbs, uh, caramelized onion in there. And those were our starters. And then the entrees we did, of course, Texas grass-fed brisket. Mm -hmm. Duh. And then I did my bacteria battling chimichurri, which is a recipe that I use in the reset the microbiome part of the anti-anxiety anti diet. So really rich in like oregano, garlic, olive oil, a lot of antimicrobials in there. And uh, the chimichurri was a side for the meat. And then we made that into an aioli with like an avocado based mayo as well, just for different texture. And I did two salads. I did my roasted cauliflower pine nut salad in the anti-anxiety diet cookbook, which has massaged kale and really nice. I like to roast vegetables to get that mylar browning, that crunch, mm -hmm. that caramelization of flavor. I'm really into complexities of flavors. Uh, and that has actually pine nuts as well as some chopped date, which was fun because it was during keto cons. It's all keto people. And I don't think anyone in the room had had a 
part of a date in years, or at least in their commitment of keto. Uh, Ryan Lowry had a continuous glucose uh, monitor on, and he ate that. He also ate my other salad, which was a avocado, pepita, pickled red onion, just yummy, like lime juice, olive oil, cumin, so really like warming, bright flavors, and that was just my leafy green salad. And then uh, the dessert was my lemon lavender CBD balls. Mm, I saw that in the book. Yeah. I want to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> so those use macadamia nut uh, and Brazil nut and coconut oil as the base, and then you set them in the freezer, and so they have this like truffle melt in your mouth mouthfeel because of those fats. And that uses a little bit of raw unfiltered honey in there. And so I was like joking, I was going around and we were all watching Ryan's numbers and such. And I mean, like not even a blip in the radar. And and that goes to my whole principles of metabolic flexibility, you know, and like how real foods I feel like should always be the priority. I mean, there's so many things to unpack there, but I I feel (laughs) like I, I love how you eat that way and promote that way of living and everything like that. But I think a lot of people kind of go down this rabbit hole where they sort of identify with a diet, whether it's carnivore diet, right? And I'm not picking on that, but so many people get amazing benefits from that, whether it's keto, whatever it is. And if, if a certain food, for example, dates or honey doesn't fit within that sort of construct, they're like, oh no, I can't eat that. Right. But, but what you're saying is like, well, we should have some ability to have like some resiliency to be able to consume these things. And even if you look at objective biomarkers, like continuous glucose monitoring, you know, when eaten, not as the sole meal, but in part of a healthy meal, it's not going to affect things in a negative way for most people. So Right. I think that one of my favorite mantras I use is doctrine creates disconnect. And I feel like when you look at a diet or a protocol as Bible or like you're just subscribed to it blindly, then you're not going to be able to listen to the subtle feedback of your body saying it's not working or maybe you need to modify. And I really think if we're using food as medicine, we need to be open to flexibility. And when we're talking ketosis, which I'm a huge proponent of the ketogenic diet, of course, Uh, when we're talking use of therapeutic levels of ketones, we all come at a different level of metabolic handicap and we all have different metabolic flexibility based on our muscle mass, mass activity factor, uh, genetics and um, hormone state. And all of this is going to play a role with that pendulum swing of do we have to stay under 30 grams of carbs or like Danny Vega, can we eat 120 grams of carbs and still be busting ketones in our bloodstream? Uh, So I think that as the the drive or the growth of the keto brand, I guess, expands that to make this a sustainable movement and for everyone to get the benefit of the hormesis and the metabolic influence that we need to be open to, again, this kind of whole food approach. Which is important. Um, Have you found that people getting off vegetables, I mean, because the carnivore thing I think is relatively new. I mean, with in terms yeah. of a dietary construct, yeah. right, like zero carb and things like that, have you found what subset of your clients have you found that really benefit from just saying, all right, I'm going to back off? Even like you said, fermented veggies and things like that you, that you just described and you talk about in the book. Um, is there a subset? And, and is it people with autoimmunity, people with depression, people with history of antibiotics, lack of breastfeeding? Like, have you found any correlation or... Of the benefits of a of going uh, yeah going like sure. totally plant free you know again and it's this I don't think we have to look at things as polarizing of on and off right and so I think that there can be a lot I believe that meat heals I believe and I talk about that in my book my journey of really my onset of panic attacks I think was highly attributed to a vegan diet and especially a four month stint of a raw vegan diet just laced in anti nutrients following the vegan diet of high gluten, high soy, and other gut stressors. So the state of my gut at that time was like the cherry on top of the sundae that just employed essentially in my body autoimmune disease and chronic deficiencies. Now someone else potentially doing higher raw matter in their diet without following intake of gluten and soy and whatnot as their primary proteins might have a little bit more resilience. So I actually use a bone broth fast as a tool when people are dealing with really severe gut distress and food sensitivity. So that is in some sense a carnivore approach because it's only broth. And uh, I have used like a six week reset of a carnivore approach for individuals. And often that can be a good tool if there is really severe dysbiosis and we just want to kind of slow down the fermentation process in the body, generally speaking. But I do feel that with functional medicine, I'm always trying to understand why someone wouldn't tolerate something instead of just don't eat this, it's bad. I always like to understand what mechanisms of action are in the compound, like what could this be doing in the body? Why at this state of my health would this be distressed? 
suppressing versus health supporting? And then how can I make my body, because I think the name of the game is how can you get your body resilient to tolerate enough abundance that you have food freedom and, um, you know, just good diversity, I think, overall. Because to, to assume that we know anything about nutrition, I think fair, like, and again, being a dietitian and writing books on diet, I think to assume we know anything about nutrition is, is a little bit funny and egotistical. And uh, we need to all be dynamic in our approach, or at least open to understanding. Totally. Yeah, I've just had recent, you know, conversations with clients who, who ascribe to this dogma, like you're, like you're kind of talking about, um, and are just instantly like throw up roadblocks when it comes to having any plant matter and so forth. And one, and I want to unpack a lot of stuff that you said, especially about uh, panic and anxiety. Um, but the whole story about the uh, cannabinoid system and the endocannabinoid system within yeah. our body and that there's these endogenous cannabinoid receptors and we get those, obviously we have endogenous, you know, cannabinoids that we can release, you know, endorphins and things like that, right? That latch onto those receptors. But a lot of the cannabinoids that people are benefiting from are from plant sources. So it makes me think, you know, so there's kind of two schools of thought, right? There's the meat camp, anti-plant camp, and then there's on the other side of the pendulum, like I think you came from at your vegan, vegan <laughs> all animal products are bad. And I think there's this happy medium, you know, for certain people. Um, but the cannabinoid system, that's kind of interesting, right? That it's the receptors, I mean, these are ex ubiquitously expressed in our body, especially central nervous system and immune system. Yes. Yeah, I think that my understanding of the enteric nervous system helped with my understanding of the cannabinoid system in the body and these kind of bilateral feedback pathways. I t did a podcast episode about breastfeeding, and a lot of people don't know because that's a common question I get is like, so is CBD safe? And um, I, I mean, my answer would be, how has it been extracted? <laughs> Obviously. Uh, but beyond that, as far as cannabidiol, like you said, we endogenously produce it, and we actually have high amounts in breast milk. And so you look at why, w again, what is the mechanism of action? Why is it there? Well, it has immunological support, it has anti-inflammatory support, it has growth development support. And so I think that that's a really beautiful thing that nature tends to provide these things, and then we as an industry and science perspective try to understand them as best we can. Uh, but. I think that there are certain compounds, yes, that plants can provoke, whether it's a mitohormesis effect or whether it's actually a phyto compound that, that serves as a CIRM, like a selective estrogen receptor modulator or something that hits a target point essentially as a compound. And those could be plant, those could be animal, and I don't think they have to be exclusive. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you mentioned the word hormesis and then mitohormesis. Can we just define that? Because I think for some people, they've heard about it, but don't really understand the concept. Yeah, it's the concept. I like to use it in comparison for exercise. I think it's the easiest way to understand it. So it, it takes into account, in a sense, the allostatic load, which is basically the amount of stressor we can take on our body to still maintain balance and even in some sense benefit and resilience from the stressor. So when we're talking about hormesis, it's that same concept of what can impact our hormones as a stressor to create beneficial expression in the body. And so we could apply this really simply conceptually with exercise, but it could be expressed with the ketogenic diet, a particular compound, in, uh, intermittent fasting or calorie restriction, as well as like sauna use, all of these health supporting behaviors on their own and if done appropriately and listening to the feedback of the body are gonna support that mitohormesis. But if you're lifting a five pound weight, you know, let's say for, and, and I, you know, I'm a moderate exerciser, but if you're lifting a five pound weight for like 20 reps and you're doing four sets of it, that's gonna support this hormetic effect and a benefit. You're gonna gain muscle maintenance, right? You're gonna tear that tissue, repair it, being in a good place. If you had a gun to your head and you had to lift a five pound weight, me, not you, five pounds for me is a lot more. Uh, if I had to lift that five pound weight for 24 hours, that would be a negative impact. It would have so much atrophy on my system that that would be a hormetic stressor that would not gain that mitohormesis or the influence that the mitochondria has in a stressed environment to endogenously, meaning within the body, produce more antioxidants. So mm -hmm. that's the long-term definition for you. It's <laughs> beautiful. No, I think this is such an important point because there's so many different roads we can go down. And I think a lot of people, when it comes to nutrition, things become very binary for them. Yes. Stress raises cortisol. I did a little meme on my Instagram. You know, stress raises cortisol. Cortisol is bad. So then, or stress is bad, or fasting is bad because it raises cortisol. But we need to understand that there's this U shaped curve, and then there's also these diurnal rhythms, for example, in yes. cortisol release or exercise. So, yeah, if you just look at the example that you just eloquently talked about in exercise, 
periodic stressors, good prolonged overtraining, like you use the analogy, the gun to the head would be problematic. So I think we need to realize that in the context too of potentially like you were referring to with, with that wonderful meal that I missed, unfortunately, <laughs> um, the phytonutrients in there and these yes. different compounns, curcuminoids, resveratrol. Uh, and, and I think these things, get, you know, maybe industry has overhyped them because now cur- sure. the price of curcumin has gone through the roof. Like everyone, mm-hmm. you remember in, like a few years ago, uh, maybe it's 2008, resveratrol came on the market. And it was hot after David Sinclair right. study in animals. You know, these things have they keep coming out and we get a lot more you know publicity around them um but the reason why i think they're pretty interesting is like you said that small little hormetic stress induces favorable adaptations generally within the body uh one study mark Rydell looked at sulforaphane for use in individuals that had um, asthma and inflammatory lung issues and found that that small hormetic stress from the sulforaphane glucosinolate from broccoli sprouts was able to induce glutathione levels and induce superoxide dismutase and all these, you know, quinone reductase, all these enzymes that detoxify like car exhaust, right? Right. Um, so, but there's some people that are like, wait, that hormetic stress from vegetables is deleterious. Right. So it sounds like for you, you like to sprinkle these things in, but don't overexercise or overeat them. Is that? And I would say the same thing if we're talking about sulforaphane and broccoli sprout, right? Like I would say, again, what is the mechanism of action? What's the output? And what's the standpoint of your entry point of the individual, right? And so if we're talking about sulforaphane and that helping to support endogenous glutathione stores, you, you, I don't think that there's, I think it's okay to say that there's anti-nutrients and that the plant's trying to defend itself. And I understand that logic and concept and I understand lectins and I understand the gut. But I think that if we're looking at the levels of glutathione increasing from response to this stimulant, that in most individuals that would probably yield some beneficial outcomes. Now there's some individuals that might have an immunological inflammatory response to broccoli. That's not going to be their friend. There's some individuals that are going to have such severe leaky gut that any kind of anti-nutrient and that permeability distresses the immune system and that also might be a negative thing. But If you're looking at something myopic, like I think it'd be clear to say all people would say that alcohol, which is a neurotoxin, does not induce internal glutathione productivity. And no research studies show that. So that's a very clear thing. Like alcohol is a toxin for the body. Uh, But I don't think we can necessarily say that about naturally occurring plant compounds. Great point. Um, Maybe because we won't have an opportunity to to talk about alcohol later, but where does that fit in? Uh, Because obviously, you know, Dry Farm Wines has been great at like sponsoring events and I can consume like two glasses of dry farm wines and not have like a hangover and things like that. Where does alcohol fit into your dietary construct? So me personally or yeah. the anti-anxiety diet? Maybe both. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I walk the walk, of course, but I am a fan of wine for sure. Uh, so, and I think like anything, right, Mike, we, when we have a strong belief, like that doctrine creates disconnect, we look for research that supports our argument. And for me, wine is a food that really brings me joy. And I grew up drinking wine and, you know, I have really fond memories of Sonoma and Napa and varied areas uh, of wine country. And for me, it's a really cool relationship with the earth. Like I love the terroir, if you will, right? The play of the soil and the season and the minerality on the grape. And I think that it's a really beautiful way to experience nature um, in in a celebratory form. Mm -hmm. So I'm a proponent of wine. Uh, I do look for those, yes, that have testing for glyphosate. And I do look for those that have no added sugars and other big things like mega purple and food colorants, of course. Uh, But I probably have a glass of wine five days a week. Um, so pretty regular piece of the puzzle, but not in excess. Sure. I think that's important. Yeah. Like you can be too restrictive. I mean, I found like if I really, so what I do, like I'll have a little alcohol tonight. I usually do kombucha beer. Mm-hmm. Do you do, ever drink kombucha beer? I don't. Oh my gosh. I mean, I know you're from the Midwest. So yeah. this company in Michigan, Unity Vibration, they make an amazing kombucha beer. So okay. they infuse little hops into it. It's like barrel fermented. Ooh. Like it's really, really rich and robust. Um, but I found like if I say, okay, like a lot, a lot of people right now are doing this sober October, right? Uh-huh. Or they're not drinking at all. If I do something like that, then at the end, I feel like I got, it's almost like I fasted for five days, you know, and, and I'll over consume. So I think like a little bit of planned yeah. bad behavior is better <laughs> than, and that sounds weird. And I think bodybuilders have done this for a long time, a cheat day, right? Yeah. And, Maybe you don't go have McDonald's and, and Chick-fil-A, but you can maybe have the buckwheat pancakes or something along sure. those lines. So having a little plan flexibility in there. And I find that, have you seen this with your clients, that people that are too regimented, like they count every calorie, every macro, oh. tra- and then they, they're wondering like why 
stuff doesn't work where they go off the rails like have you seen well that? that's like the anti-anxiety diet because i think that even the healthiest perfect diet on the planet in an individual that is being obsessive about it or is white knuckling it or is hating their body into healing i always say you can't hate your body into healing you have to love and accept your body obviously if you want to make therapeutic change and you have to make peace with the wild stallion of your brain because if you're just on this racing thought difficulty concentrating that's keeping you in a sympathetic state and i mean that's some of the not to go way into the book right away but i mean that's where we look at things like secretory iga and lps and these markers of gut integrity being impacted by things like social anxiety and stress alone nothing to do with diet so even if again you're eating the most therapeutic anti-inflammatory diet, but you're stressed out about the perfection of your program, you may not have as beneficial of influence of someone that has a little bit of screw it threshold in them or a little bit of uh, a, a interpretive intake versus that kind of white knuckle all or nothing. That's a great, I mean, I love that mindset. You know, there's some studies that actually, and I haven't read these recently, but in the past couple of years where people, if they're, if they're in a really bad mood or they say they think negative thoughts about the food they eat. It can affect the postprandial meal response and glucose and immunological response. Have you looked at some of that research? I have not looked on a blood sugar level, but I talk so much about the nocebo effect because I think we talk about in the health industry and especially wellness movements, importance of like mantra, which I'm a huge fan of mantra and mindfulness and, you know, rewriting the script of the cassette reel of, of your inner self speak, if you will. Uh, but I love the influence of the nocebo effect because I think that that resonates to everyone. Like some people, when they hear mantra and positive thoughts, they're like, okay, poly positive. And I think a lot of men don't really like, it doesn't resonate in some ways they feel too, whether it's woo or whatever. Right. But there's been studies done. I'm going to forget the gentleman's name. Um, but with the nocebo effect where they've done a drip of an IV saline solution. They told individuals that it was chemotherapy and 30% of them lost their hair. Like that's insane. I mean, it would be one thing, over 60% of them had a blood, had a, excuse me, nausea and vomiting response. And I understand with enteric nervous system connection, you could think yourself to ill as far as a, a GI reaction, but to lose your hair, that's some serious influence on the body that our thoughts have. And that's where that, you know, nocebo literally translates to thoughts that harm. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing to think about. That's so huge. I have not heard that about chemo, but I have heard um, there was some individual in World War One who was a surgeon and he ran out of antiseptic uh, and, and pain, whatever. So he just hooked them up with the saline IV and told them it was morphine and then would operate on these soldiers, uh, soldiers that had like, they needed amputations, whatever, and they didn't feel the surgery and all the that. So this, effect. Yeah, yeah, the belief so, of healing. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's the same thing, but in the opposite, I guess, but it's, that is super powerful. But it, it, you know, what's funny is like when you read these scientific studies, they want to like control for the placebo effect and like diminish it and undermine that. And, and, but it's like, why not leverage that? Like if you can in your favor, right? Um, yeah, super fascinating stuff. So yeah. mindset is a big part of like what you do as well. Absolutely. So I'm really, I mean, the whole kind of positioning is that, I feel that in today's society, all of us have some level of not feeling safe. And that's a really crazy thing to say out loud because most of us have a shelter over our head, some form of, of financial security, food to eat, whatnot, right? If we're listening to the podcast, we have access to technology and whatnot. And so we would all be like, yeah, yeah, I'm safe. But when I'm talking about safe, I'm talking about the HPA axis and this sympathetic versus parasympathetic state. And a lot of us via the blue light dopamine response, via this cognitive disconnect of self-actualization of who we think we should be and where we are today, or just the stress demands we take on, positive or negative, we're running in the sympathetic fight or flight response. And that itself can create such a cascade of, of where I call anxiety, the Achilles heel to wellness. And I feel that we're all seeking to feel safe. And whatever we can do to get the body nutrient supported, gut supported, dietary supported, supplemental support, and the mental peace mantra and cognitive reset that we all just need to get there. And so actually that's one of my favorite mantras to use. And I use it often is just literally saying the word safe. Um, I'll have clients before their meal time that work like high powered attorney X, Y, Z. That's just go, go, go. I'll have them put their feet down and practice a couple sets of four, seven, eight breath. And for women sometimes, men too, um, I'll have them actually even like strike their, their, their legs so they get this physical hit and I have them go safe. And I'll have them go safe. 
and they do it like three times. And I'm telling you, there's this like vagus nerve reset that occurs. I haven't studied that, but I know thoughts can impact your vagus nerve and I know that breath can impact your vagus nerve. And I'm telling you that the way that their body receives the nourishment at that meal is likely more favorable than had they done that in a distracted environment or still that sympathetic fight or flight response, answering email, whatnot, that the body's gonna receive it as more nourishing. Amazing. So the smacking of the legs, that's a way to like, in they do tapping in, yeah. um, what is it? Uh, EFT or? Yeah, EFT. There's a lot of different methodologies. Um, I'm thinking of Reiki and it's like tapping like that mm-hmm. as a way to like kind of prime different things of right. energetically and things. So that's really cool. Now, you couldn't do that at a business meeting, but maybe you could like kind of rub yourself or something along those lines. Right. I always say with mantra or phrases like that, you want it to become almost osmotic. You want to practice it so much, just like you would lift a weight to gain a muscle in your arm. You need to build these thought patterns to become natural. Uh, And it feels forceful at first. It feels uncomfortable. And just like, again, workout and whatnot, there's that distress response. But eventually what you want is these positive thoughts to bathe you and them to find you at times of need versus like taking on and and taking off your tool belt. (laughs) You know, you want the tool belt on, you need to activate it and get it accessible so that when it's time of need, you're ready and you can employ those tools. And like I said, I really think it's grounding that, I love thinking of the brain as the wild stallion because it's that beepu bapu um, ongoing racing thought that can just really distress and, and keep us from that feeling of safety. Yeah, that's huge. You mentioned four, seven, eight breathing. Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? So yeah. in, I'm sure that's a pattern of inhale, exhale, hold, retention, and then repeat. Yeah. So it's actually the work of Dr. Andrew Weil, and there's a lot of research studies published on it. And so I talk about it in the book and it's in for four through the nose, holding for seven. And then the eight is a like shushing whoosh, like a shh. And it's really interesting because it also, I think, helps the envisioning of like pressing the air out of an inner tube, you know? It has that same sound effect, I think. And there's an effect, I believe, with, with the way that you exhale when you're whooshing. And that that positioning of the double exhale to four inhale and holding does really help to get into a parasympathetic state. It's amazing breath work. I mean, I've been, uh, what's his, Herbert Benson had this book a long time ago called The Relaxation Response, and, and he did some research in cancer outcomes and taught breath work and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, breath work's so powerful. Have you done any Wim Hof type stuff or just mostly this technique? I, I've been looking into him and I think it looks amazing, yeah. uh, but no, I have not yet personally. It's so powerful. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just one thing that so many people can do because Free, I think- powerful, yeah. Right, <laughs> I mean, it can totally shift your state. I mean, you know, I used to be like, driving around, I was a sales rep for a number of years and would come home after traffic and be frustrated. And instead of like dealing properly with my emotions, I would have a glass of wine right away. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, man, if I just knew in my car, I could do something like you just said, the four, seven, eights or some Wim Hof type stuff, which is basically hyperventilation followed by retention. Uh, it, It just has this huge impact on your central nervous system. But it's kind of funny, if you were to look at the physiology of breath work, right, you might see a transient increase in adrenaline and noradrenaline, which is followed by an increase in the parasympathetic system. So you'd think it was bad, maybe, right? Yeah. If you viewed, if you viewed, <laughs> yeah, so it's like we have to stop looking at these things from a binary lens. Anyway, um, so let's talk about panic and anxiety, uh, because I presume, and you just talked about that, that you used to suffer from this and you've overcome it. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's always a friend that comes at times of need, but I believe I have a really solid amount of bubble wrap for it. And I understand how to preemptively support resilience at times of stress. So with my move I just had, you know, it's like, I, I think that we all, human nature, we think that we get a badge of courage for taking on too many things and not saying no and not, you know, prioritizing our to-do list and, and, and wearing too many hats. And I think that that's another one of those, again, why we don't feel safe. Uh, but I now feel really strong in the tools, whether it's adjusting my adaptogens or maybe upping L-theanine or layering in some phosphatidylserine if I'm experiencing higher cortisol output, uh, that I'm able to kind of modulate my intake, both dietarily as as well as supplementally. And then I try to now at this point be very uh, just 
to the point with what I say no to. And I think having a child helps that because Stella will, will call to my attention if I'm you know not giving her enough energy or time. And so that really allows me to be quite brutal with my commitments. And that's essential, I think, as a, as a piece of the puzzle. But the onset of my panic attack and whatnot, at that time I had a ferritin level of two so for listeners, you know, you can start losing hair at a ferritin level of 60. So I had a ferritin level of two, and uh, this is a storage marker of your iron. And I also was anemic, and I had functionally low B12. And this wasn't even on a intracellular test. This is just like a serum low B12. I was vegan again. Uh, and uh, I also had low zinc. And those are really powerful nutrients that play a role with mood stability and mental health. And so I, of course, used like a sublingual B12, brought up the zinc, and, and you know, zinc is one of those mood stabilizing minerals that has some pretty powerful effects with GABA. And uh, started eating meat, <laughs> essentially. I mean, I literally, best year clinic gave me a handout. They're like, these are vegetarian forms of iron. And I was like, yeah. I know about, I know about anti-nutrients. I know why I'm here. It was kind of, I needed that though, experience of that dip of that extreme to go the other way. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel that, that animal products have really helped. And then adopting a high-fat ketogenic diet has taken that to the next level as far as providing this foundation of a more grounded, stabilized mental state. Oh, man. So many questions here. So how, <laughs> long, how long were you vegan? So I was vegan for three. I was vegetarian for, I think, five years. About three of those were vegan and four months of those were raw vegan. And that was when, like I said. The, it was like the pinnacle. That, yeah. <clears throat> that was the worst. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I found, because I've had anxiety in periods of, I don't know if I would call it panic or not, but I feel like it's like these neurons start to become comfortable getting into that state. And so it's almost like, I mean, obviously there's a nutritional element that we're going to talk about in the central nervous system, but I feel like once it you once you start wiring those neuronal pathways, it's easier and easier to trigger that. Did you find that? Yes, and then, yes. Um, I, and I know... Uh, you know, Bill Harris has talked a lot about that and, and other people, but so how, or sorry, Dan Harris. So how did you, what, what were the panic attacks like? Like what, what were you doing or what would trigger them at that time? So at that time I was a student at an naturopathic college of medicine, best year, and I am a type A individual and I'm the type that like, I'm going, I'm going to do it the best, not just for the A on the paper, but because I need to master this content. And I just was really nerding out hard. I was working also to support my education and uh, was doing like 6 a.m. farmer's markets for Full Circle Farm out in Carnation and uh, just burning the midnight oil. I think I was definitely underslept and malnourished, like I said. And so the, the experience of this would be like, I remember one time I was driving a farm truck, which was like an old postal truck. And I I forget which bridge it was, but it was uh, south towards Queen Anne. And I got the truck stuck in the darn bridge. It was one of those like, (laughs) yeah, right. I mean, I think that would give anyone anxiety. But uh, I mean, I remember like that one was a one that I couldn't come down from. Like I was like in a ball and I needed someone to take over the mar- Like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Operate the truck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had it. to back out the truck physically because it was stuck in the thing. So I had to go to the middle of the uh, of the dotted line to get the truck through because the arch that I was able to pass through. And then I pulled over and I was like, can't do it. Um, but it would be shortness of breath. It would be tremors. So like really severe where people could see me shaking. You know, sometimes we feel a little bit of that epinephrine surge. Uh, but really harmful, just feeling uh, sick, just feeling ill and wanting to escape your, wanting to run out of your body mm-hmm. is the best way to describe it. Did you and depersonalize at all? Like during those moments where you depersonalize, where you kind of like feel like you're there, but you're not really? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Totally. Like looking outside of yeah. your body. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I mean, it, it the panic attack period only lasted probably a good couple weeks, thank God. Um, and I, I went within four weeks, I was eating ribeyes. Um, so it was a pretty rapid, it, was, it started a raw oysters um, off of the islands and then uh, egg yolks in my green smoothies and then it just kind of cascaded quite rapidly. My husband was eating a grass-fed steak in a cast iron and I was cramming for an exam and we joke how I like floated like a cartoon character, <laughs> like the like cat. And he turned around, I don't know what he was doing and I had half the steak gone. He was wow. like, whoa, dude. <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> that feels yeah. good. Uh huh. That's amazing. So to get your iron up, did you do IV iron or did you just eat your way? Just ferrous sulfate, yeah. Just a, just a good form of uh, supplemental iron and ate, I started eating red meat about like four times a week. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so what the impetus for you to go vegan back then was what? Philosophical? A- environmental. Animal rights and environmental. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then how do you, because I, I think those issues, and I, 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 we're going to still talk about the panic train, but I kind of yeah. want to talk about, I think that's interesting for people because 
and I admit I used to kind of confuse or obfuscate these issues where we talk about like in the recent study in Annals of Internal Medicine came out. It was a new systematic review of all the data, the observational data, RCTs. But I think a lot of people still confuse the topics. And when we talk about human health, that's one issue. But then, you know, the environmental, the animal welfare are totally separate issues. So how do you now as a omnivore meat eater, how do you reconcile that mentally? Well, I was actually able to, st- it's funny, while I was still a pretty staunch vegan, uh, I was talking about this at Best Year, uh, I had a lot of professors to start to challenge my perspective, like, you can get butter churned up the road. Uh, for instance, you know, tomorrow we're going to Herb Farm, which is a restaurant, we're going to get everything sourced in, within 100 miles, which is awesome. And, you know, I was eating at that time, this is like 2007, earth balance, organic, you know, no trans fats, but still, right, spreadable butter-like substance, right, chemical shitstorm. And um, I knew there was a part of me, that's that doctrine creates disconnect, and that's why I love that mantra, because there was a part of me in my gut that knew that that wasn't a real food, and there was a part of me in my gut that knew that that wasn't sustainable, but I was so sink, line, hook into this animal product bad that, that I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it clearly. Um, so I started to get challenged, though, by professors quite early on about things like that and, uh, you know, benefits of eggs and like, okay, so why won't you eat eggs? You could have your own chickens. There's no harm done. It's, you know, it's not a fertilized egg, whatnot. And um, I started to make peace with being open to some of those concepts. And then I started learning about biodynamic farming. And that, my husband was farming, like I said, at Full Circle, an organic farm, and I was doing their farmer's market. And I started to really understand not just how animals could support agriculture, but how animals are essential to agriculture. And that really helped me to be like, whoa, you know, so actually when the chickens follow the ruminants, you know, and that that ruminant is the best plow out there. And you're saying we don't have to use corn derived fossil fuel, you know, fossil fuel or corn derived ethanol um, to fuel a tractor if we have these animals in the or to the level of, right? Um, and so I think that when you understand sustainably, I don't think you can really, the, the depths of sustainability relies on that diversity of the ecosystem. And I think that that necessitates an omnivore approach. That's amazing. So I didn't realize your husband was farming at Full Circle. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Uh-huh. So you got to see the whole product. And this was like over a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. That is so awesome. And yeah. now it's like the thing that everyone's talking about, sustainable agriculture and how we need the ruminants. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing the cycle of, of the manure and the chickens going there. And I mean, it's just, and uh, I haven't showed you our chickens and pigs yeah. yet, but we'll check them out later. Cool. Um, now, do you guys have aspirations of having a farm one day to like do this or... I, I think in some level, but not in Austin, Texas. <laughs> That's way too hard, man. Um, yeah, and I, I think that we have so many irons in the fire right now. I've, I've been just trying to keep my backyard garden happening, and now with the move, we're going to reset that. So that'll be a good entry point. What are you growing? Nothing now because the, the new move, yeah. yeah. But what, <laughs> so, like what grows well in Texas? Well, uh, okra. <laughs> Okra, uh, a lot of the like zucchini family, um, so a lot of fun y- yellow squashes and uh, heirloom varietals there. Tomatoes can do okay. Uh, herbs can do, of course, well. Rosemary grows fantastic. Uh, leafy greens are pretty pretty good, especially the more winter turgid greens like varietals of kale and collards and chard. Uh, so yeah, we just had like little raised beds. That's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing how resilient kale is. I mean, yeah. we had a snowstorm here last couple of years. We've had it snow, which is weird. And the only thing standing, so the Swiss chard was done, like the herbs oh, yeah. were done. Tomatoes, obviously toast. Um, but And the kale was just like still going strong. It was like, it's so hearty. And that kind of made me think, gosh, well, it's like maybe it's digestibility. Like you have to massage it. Like you have to do, do. some different things. Yeah. Cook it. Because, I, you know, a lot of people, especially the raw vegan community, is like having raw kale yeah. a lot. And uh, yeah, my wife and I went down that road as well. Mm-hmm. I wasn't strict raw vegan, but doing a lot of the, the raw type stuff. And so... When it comes to like delicata squash or zucchini, you know, there's a lot of talk about the anti-nutrients in the seed and mm-hmm. the lectins. Are you pretty adamant about removing that before you, you personally cook that for your family? We do, yeah. Um, but zucchini, I don't worry about like the insides of a zucchini. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Something like that. Again, if I felt that, um, so my Stella, she was an emergency C-section. It was a water birth gone C-section. Um, and so that was pretty radical from my, and, and knowing the influence on an infant's mito, uh, microbiome and vaginal inoculation and whatnot. So I was really tight with Stella um, and still, but I would say the first two years of age, because that's really what research supports is the timestamp to really get optimal gut integrity developed. Uh, we did vaginal inoculation. Um, so of course, I and I, 
Oh, should I explain that? No, Probably. Let's do it. Okay. It's so <laughs> a important. little off kilter, but I think it's important to discuss. Yes. So yeah, so we did a vaginal inoculation where basically we used non-sterile gauze, inserted that in me vaginally, and then as soon as she was born, um, she was given to me, of course, and my midwife was using that gauze uh, in her mouth, in her all of her oral, ocular, nasal biome, right? So we're just kind of putting that all over her body, having her suck on the gauze, and um, that was done for the first three hours post birth wow. and um, multiple consecutive sessions yes yes and then of course breastfeeding mm-hmm. uh, and so that's the the second way that you can inoculate of course your child right away from birth and there's beautiful things in breast milk like human uh, HMOs human milk oligosaccharides and as I mentioned cannabidiol and, and so forth um, but my point with the, the the zucchini is that you know Stella to me I know she's also, we've done her genetics. So like I come with her at this like bubble child, bless her heart. And I'm like, oh, she's maybe intestinally compromised. So like there's no, I'm not going to put any lectin or or low, low, low levels of lectin. So we were very mindful about the foods we were giving her. Uh, She didn't have a single grain and still really hasn't under my control. Uh, And, you know, I was really tight and adamant about that. Now someone like my gut, um, where I feel quite resilient, I'm using L-glutamine pretty regularly, some DGL, drinking bone broth pretty much daily. I'm not worried about that. I don't have any bloating distension. I don't have any changes in my bowel. I don't have any inflammatory response, fluid retention. To me, I feel like that's pass. I'm good with you, zucchini seed. Uh, But I wouldn't be chomping down, maybe, you know, roasting the delicata squash seeds. Um, And if I was, I'd soak them first and then again, listen to the feedback of the body. That's amazing. Gosh, I have not heard someone so being so intentional about their children's microbiome, which is (laughs) so awesome because uh, my brother and his wife, they're pregnant right now. And I was telling them, the same thing and to look up the inoculation because just in case they have a c-section who knows right what, yeah. was your baby breached or what was the yeah she was so i had a my uterus actually engulfed her head um so it's called a millarian fusion and um even in the c-section time stamp it's like so thank god we figured that out because that could have been a really gnarly situation um and uh, in the c-section the specialist ob told me that it was his top five memorable experiences and that he had to actually um, insert his entire forearm and scoop her head out of my uterus and usually if they're breached you just pop their booty out and they come out but he had to get her head out of my uterus so she was in there yeah it's amazing and how long did you um did you leave the umbilical cord for like a minute or something we did it was i think it was actually 90 seconds if i'm not I have that somewhere in my blog. I have a blog called My Natural C-Section because <laughs> that's the best way to, you know, how natural could you do it? Um, and, you know, so we did, like, I was able to see her delivery and, um, you know, only did one uh, IV arm. So I had my other arm available for breastfeeding. And we did everything we could to mitigate the high stress, you know, industrialized right. <laughs> delivery process. Now, did you, were you pretty forward with the doctors, like, going into the C-Section? Like, hey, we're trying to do a natural birth. Here's what we want to do. Yeah. And were they like, okay, weirdo, we're going to, were they cool about it? Well, the cool thing was the the high-risk OBGYN was my midwife's specialist. So they had a working relationship, and I think he probably is used to, when she refers out, he knows the, the kind of, concept or at least at least some level of foundational clientele uh and but what was really funny is actually as he was uh, sewing me up he was laughing because we were talking about somehow I, I told him what i do and was talking functional medicine and biochem and i don't know how and I, mind you i'm on a morphine drip right yeah. and i don't know how but i distinctly remember because he looks up at me and he says you are the most intelligent post. like how did this ha- what is going on i was talking to him about myoinositol and pcos and testosterone probably because i was high on morphine yeah, i don't even know why <laughs> but for some reason i was like oh you know what you need to do if you have a client that's high in testosterone you need to give them four to eight grams of myoinositol and i guess i was going on about it that's so funny <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome you know most people don't know about my myoinositol it's one of my favorite you know kind of forms of inositol yes. that's amazing um yeah, I remember like, you know, I, the microbiome was, was just emerging in 2012 when my wife had her C-section. Again, unplanned the complications, I think, were iatrogenic, medically induced, but we'll talk about that later. But yeah, it was like the fir- they were ready to cut the cord right away. I had to like intervene. Yeah. You know, it was hep B shot, all, you know, all this sort of stuff. So my next kind of question here is, and this is very controversial, vaccines. Like where yeah. do you stand on the whole, like what have you, what it, CDC schedule is one thing, where yeah. do you stand on that? So, uh, and we also, of course, signed off to not do erythromycin on the eyes, yeah. all that stuff. Uh, so um, Stella has not had any vaccines yet. And she's three, she was three in June, so she's about three and a half. 
Uh, now, I ran her genetics before I made that decision. So again, I don't have a myopic vaccines bad, good, you know, whatever. It's, it's a what is the susceptibility and vulnerability of the child. So again, Stella already had, in my opinion, a notch on the belt of microbiome, even though I was doing what I could, like I said, to mitigate the experience, I knew it was still not optimal. So that's one notch on the belt. She's double six, seven, seven, uh, the six, seven, seven, C, the C six seven seven T, excuse me, MTHFR, um, and she also GST one homogenous. Uh, so she's a pretty terrible candidate for vaccines, and what that means for listeners. So I know that they've heard you guys talk about MTHFR. Um, so both her methylation process, but also her glutathione processes are hindered. And being that she's homozygous, that means both my husband and I gave her our dirty gene, and so she's quite impaired in the way that her body would work with adjuvants and um, metals. And I think that she'd be a really high, I can't say because we likely won't find out, um, but I think that she would be a really high risk autism case had we not done our research. Now, had she been heterozygous on maybe just MTHFR and maybe if the less dominant, the A copy of the gene was clean, then maybe I would consider like a glutathione vitamin C protocol. And I do help patients do that. So we kind of work with upregulating the detox process and reducing oxidative stress in the body. And then of course, fueling the brain. So we go like pretty high EPA, DHA, MCT. But again, not an infant. You can't do much with infants. I don't. I don't really start dosing anyone with any nutraceuticals until they're at 20 pounds, um, which usually means like the six-month minimal marker. Mm -hmm. Now in Texas, I know measles. They say an outbreak. I think in Washington State in the last 12 months there were 70 uh, cases of measles. Are you worried about? I mean, you know, there's diphtheria. I mean, you know, tetanus. I mean, what are, they, are you worried about any of these things? Or are you gonna Are you gonna wait till later when the risk of developing Autism could be, you know, substantially reduced over time, or are you just going to say, "Look, we're not going to do anything until she's like, you know, reproductive age." Right, 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 right. Has autonomy and yeah. <laughs> is out of my house. No, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that'll be her. That'll be her rebellion. I'm getting all my vaccines, yeah. mom. <laughs> she's like, "Oh my armor." I got a tetanus shot like, a few weeks ago, and oh my, my shoulder seriously hurt. Like I did a hard work for like ten days. Yeah. It was weird. I almost I was going to call. Because I stepped on a nail, I do construction here. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, my risk was high. But anyway, you were saying. Right. Oh, so, so you know, I think that like when I think of like measles and things like that, again, how is the function of the immune system of the individual? Yeah. Are they taking immune supportive supplements? Where's their vitamin D status at? Are they malnourished? My daughter's none of those things. So yeah. I, I, really I don't concerned. really have a lot of fear. And, and um, you know, I think that, uh, and that's going to be fun in the comments. But no, I really don't. Um, I, I think that... She has a very strong immune system, and I think that we are very proactive with what we supplement her with, what we use to support her diet. And I, I mean, she's in school, the yoga peace school, and I'm telling you, every other week it's like hand and foot or hand, foot and mouth syndrome or streps going around or whatnot. She's not been sick once, single time. Um, she ran a fever one day that was like 102, and next day kicked it. And so, you know, we just kind of, again, I think that with strategic supplementation, you can pulse in, pulse out, and you can use things when you see that the body is in a distress mode, and you can usually proactively get around that. That's amazing. You know, I hope people listen to this with an open mind, because I think the vaccine things is kind of like liberal versus conservative. It's very reactionary. Yeah. And hearing your approach in the background research and all the intention that you put just on the post birth process to really restore the microbiome, which I think everyone probably knows, but is really intimately connected to the development of the immune system, yes. which is kind of why we vaccinate in the first place. Right. Um, I, that's a super important point, because I, I think some people are reactionary and like, Oh, allopathic medicine's bad. Natural medicine's right. good. Vaccines bad. You just use Bach flower remedies. But there's there's context and application for both, and strengths and weaknesses. But um, so here's a question for you. Uh, all three of us, my wife and my daughter, are going to Chile okay. uh, in early November, and so they recommend CDC recommends um, MMR, which mm -hmm. she hasn't had yet. A few other things. I mean, I think like tetanus. I can't remember hepatitis A. A few other things. Mm -hmm. So the MMR kind of worries me because it's a live vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember the adjuvants. I want to say there wasn't aluminum in there, but right. okay. If your daughter was seven and you guys were going to South America, right. what, what would you do? Well, what are my question would be? What happens if you get MMR? Right. 
you the side effects yeah, yeah oh I, I i mean yeah well there's actually i've looked at the there's a seven page report actually on the website uh-huh. there's some pretty i mean they're rare but right. some of the serious side effects are very like blindness the um uh, paralysis but again i think it's when the immune system goes septic mm-hmm. like right like so usually it's diarrhea it's fever it, you know so it's like I always look at like what are we getting ahead of? What's the risk factor and and the likelihood? Like, hate to say, it, and then gotta switch this. Um, like the flu shot, it's like usually forty percent efficacy of the flu shot, right? Because we don't know what strain we're chasing, and um, the flu, yes, does kill people every year. But these are again extremely immune, compromised, malnourished people. It's not going to take out a healthy body that has resilience. I just yeah, so no, that's a good point. So you'd say no. I mean, hep- I think hepatitis is different, at least in my eyes. Yes, I do too. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know that there's a cure for hepatitis, no. and yeah. you don't want a chronic liver. Your liver is kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. No, so I'm like that, I would totally jump on, and um, right, it would just be kind of transdermal glutathione, you know, a, cu- a couple of things to kind of support the system right after. Mm-hmm. Also, I would totally be into L-glutamine, like get some gut lining going beforehand, and um, you know, support with other antioxidants. Uh, and that, I think that would be a good thing. Yeah, that's good. Um, you hit on, we'll, we'll get to metabolic flexibility, but I, I feel like we didn't totally circle back on anxiety. Okay. Um, I mean, I would like to circle back. I, I, I feel like why would anxiety still be, there's some evolutionary or adaptive reasons why certain traits still persist. Depression, for example, um, anxiety, you know, um, like even in, in the state of metabolic, you know, insulin, in, insulin resistance, there is some argument in the research that it's actually protective, that it could be protective, at least in the initial phase, right? So why do humans still suffer from anxiety? Like, is there any beneficial reason? Oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, I think there's benefit of stress. I mean, I think the reason that our autonomic nervous system can go into that sympathetic state, that fight or flight response, and we're wired for these mechanisms of survival, that yes, there's some benefit. But again, I think that if you are running in one world and not getting that parasympathetic reset, that our regulatory function of our body is hindered. So we love to dumb it down and call it uh, fight or flight and rest and digest. But it's not just rest and digest in the parasympathetic state. It's reproductive health is regulated there. It's our metabolism. It's our sleep cycles, our circadian rhythm. It's our uh, orgasm. It's our oxytocin. I mean, there's so much that's regulated in that regulatory mode that is hindered if you're in that sympathetic state chronically. But absolutely, I think, you know, we when we go through trauma, a car accident or you know physiological trauma or even a dynamic trauma like having to um let's say hurricanes coming and you know you have to leave your home and whatnot we need these surges of cortisol we need these surges of glucose we need you know that that fact that the liver can dump glucose is probably a good thing you know even if we're fat adapted and not you know using a hybrid approach to our metabolism and so I think that those mechanisms of you know blood pressure shift epinephrine surge cognitive enhancement Yes, um, but with today's society, we're running in that mode. We're functioning in that mode, I think, too often. Mm, okay, so we're just not turning it off. Yeah. So it's just, okay. Yeah, interesting. I mean, so Kelly Brogan, have you followed her yeah. work at all? Yes. And so she she has a, a book, I can't remember, it just came out, a brand new one. Do you know the title? No. Okay. No. Anyway, her, her other book, A Whole New Mind, and she kind of talks about how depression and anxiety and these feelings of mental so we say lack of mental wellness or mental well-being are really signs that we're not doing the right thing with our life. Yeah. And so she's looking at it from, from obviously she talks about micronutrients and all the things that I'm sure you talk about and, and, and that we've been talking about up to now, but it was really more like, you know, these, these feelings of disease are like, it's, it's the universe or the ether or whatever energetically are telling your body like you're doing the wrong thing. And I know like t- at times when I was feeling anxious in my life, it was like, I was going down the wrong career path. I had sure. the wrong friends. I was making the wrong decisions. So I think it's, when I'm trying to ask you, it's, it's hard to disentangle poor nutrition from that conversation of like, are you doing the right thing with your life? But where does that fit into this? Well, I think that's when the internal work comes of unpacking the thoughts that you have within your mental space, right? And and really finding the origin of them. You know, are these thoughts that you've taken on from your childhood, from abusive parents, or from 
bad relationships or whatnot. And are, are, are these thought patterns something that belong to you or are they just visiting you? And how much control do you have to regulate and remove them? Because that's when I think it becomes something that's imbalancing. If you're able to export it, download it, and move on, then I think that's a reasonable you know, part of your human experience, negative thought patterns. And I think that I would totally say that the fact that anxiety comes often at times of like a disconnect or a distress mode, that yes, it is a part of a survival signal. Uh, but again, I would unpack, again, the why. I'm always saying the why. Uh, yeah, that's that kind good. of my like, you know, detective of the body thing. Well, why is this happening? Um, but you know, why am I thinking this? Because you might go through that. I use this thing with my clinic. It's called a life inventory checklist. And it's just stupid stuff. Like I, I pay my bills on time. I walk in nature or I, I'm in nature an hour a day. I take the time to laugh. I, you know, these things that, you know, you look at it and I have them rated always, sometimes and never. And to do it once and then, you know, look at it in like three months. And it's just really interesting to take the time with it because you'll realize that there's a lot of always is that you'd rather demote to, to sometimes. <laughs> and then there's some nevers that you need to squeeze into a sometimes um, and, and, you know, maybe other placement or, or reshuffling. But we fall into patterns. I mean, it's just human nature that we fall into patterns. And yes, I think anxiety can serve as an awakening to this life inventory of what might be off. But then we need to get to the resolution and the action. And if that's not resolving, then we need to think of of why why isn't it going away yeah and you found with your clients like they take more time to smell the roses over time and they spend more time in nature when they because if i feel like wellness is kind of like this the snowball right and like if if you're eating poorly sleeping poorly thinking negative thoughts hanging out with bad people all that then it's like you can't get like you just need some small wins and then things become and so now you and I are probably concerned about like things like, oh, did I ground for 20 minutes a yeah, day or yeah. did I meditate? And most people are just trying to like hit a home base, you know? Right. And so do you feel like these things, it's like this little inertia that people kind of build up as they start sure. making and then and you kind of place diet. You think diet is kind of the, the centerpiece of that? Absolutely. And I think this kind of food is medicine perspective, just like lifestyle, is this, it's, it's a both empowerment through removal as well as abundance. So am I removing myself from a toxic behavior, right? So maybe I'm not getting my nails done or painted or I'm changing from hair dye to something else. So that's like a removal element. And then there's the abundance element of I'm spending time in nature, I'm grounding. And so I think food is like that too, right? You're removing the gluten, you're removing the refined sugar, you're removing the GMO corn products, and then your abundance on these therapeutic compounds. And I think that it's that balance of both. And for whatever reason, human nature, we like to, to add things. If we're going to subtract it. I mean, I've seen in my 10 years of clinical experience that people don't do well with me just saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's, this is what you could do. This is what it could, uh, this is how it could manifest in your body. And this is how I could see it working in your life. Do you, do you envision that? How could we make this element work? Or is there a different behavior that we think we could get the similar outcomes that feels more authentic to you? Because again, going back to that disconnect thing, I think if we're going through the motions, but we don't believe in it, we don't receive it. And uh, that's a really important part of the healing process. Oh my gosh, that's huge. I mean, I haven't really thought about that, but a lot of people have, a, they put a lot of belief in conventional medicine and they feel like their doctor says, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. If, as long as you take this medicine or do this procedure, everything's gonna be okay. And there's a subset of people that that's really what they believe. And they, they don't really have this connection between diet and lifestyle and thinking that it's gonna move the lever. Are those people, do you feel like they're just not ready for this conversation? Or what sort, like, you probably have some clients where, where you deal with that. How do you approach that scenario? Well, I mean, lucky for me, all because I'm a cash practice, when they're coming to me, they're coming to me to, to lead them or to, to work in complementary care with their healthcare team. And they're wanting to layer in some of that can, you know, outside of the allopathic conventional, they, they want to layer that in, you know? So I think if I was a dietitian working in an insurance-based practice and someone's showing up with their big gulp or whatever, you know, like you're not coming to me drinking a big gulp. Um, so I don't deal with that much anymore where they're ready for change, but they may not be ready for the type of change that I'm going to recommend. Uh, so that's really interesting. Like you were saying earlier about this kind of, if we associate ego with diet, sometimes they'll come to me thinking I'm going to, for instance, recommend a ketogenic diet because I'm a big 
fan of keto and I'll be like, you know what? Your DHEA is suboptimal. We really, we really want to get your adrenals back on track and you can rebound your adrenals with a ketogenic diet. But I also know that you have XYZ going on and I also see that you're binging every Saturday. And so right now, like let's pulse that, let's pivot, let's redirect this. And so sometimes I get feedback of like, well, that's not what I wanted. And I'm like, but this is how I perceive what you need. And then we together collectively with me as your practitioner and, and you as the client need to figure out what you want to do because I'm also not going to give you a handout to collect dust and I'm also not going to prescribe a protocol that I know you walking out virtually walking out from the appointment are going to apply because what's the point of my energy and your energy in the session and I, I really I don't do things for billable hours I do things for outcomes and I do things to change people's lives and so they have to again want it buy and understand the whys and, and we have to sometimes marry the the philosophy to get there mm, that's beautiful you know I think a lot of people when I was when I was younger I didn't understand this concept of like what you just talked about meeting people where they're at and I would like force my ideas on <laughs> family members and all that and now like I have family members and, and people come in on YouTube like hey my dad or my mom or my cousin or my girlfriend or whatever I keep telling them to do this thing whether it's cutting out carbs or getting right. off the television and then they're not listening what can you send me some research and I just write back I'm like they're not ready yeah and they're like wait no that's not what I want no send me the research I'm like mm. they're just not mentally ready like you just sometimes have to back off yeah. or meet them where they're at. Maybe they're they're still going to watch TV, but instead of an hour, it's 30 minutes, right? And Or maybe they're not the TV person. They're the, then, then redirect it. Maybe they need to do HIIT training, maybe they, right? So it's like maybe there's something that resonates stronger with that individual and you just haven't found it. Not you, but the, the family member, right? They're, they're barking up the wrong tree and they need to listen to how that person isn't willing with that behavior and then think, okay, what am I trying to do to support you? I'm trying to help you lower inflammation or I'm trying to support anti-aging or um, you know enhance your cognition, dad. So, okay, how about we try adding MCT oil to your daily coffee because that's an easy behavior or how about we you know it's, it's just really figuring out where is there some openness and then I think like you said um, then we start to do the onion layer thing then it's like cool I feel a little better hey, what were you hey hey what were you saying three months ago about that TV thing like I'll check it out mm -hmm. um, and I think as you start to feel better as you start to make these lifestyle changes dietary nutrient changes that then you become more receptive and in tuned um, one of my favorite other mantras or kind of concepts is that if you go from mediocre to shitty, you're going to just stay there. Like, so you're just going to vacillate back and forth. And that's the people that say, oh, I don't feel anything. I don't, but this food doesn't hurt my body. I don't, I don't, I can eat gluten all day long. I can eat refined sugar all day long. It doesn't hurt me. And I'm like, well, you're living and, and not in a judgment way, but that's because you're living from mediocre to shitty. Um, if you can get your body to awesome or flipping fantastic, shitty is going to suck. Yeah. And you're going to remember that. And you're going to be like, dang, that was not worth it. And I think that that's where kind of the magic happens. And uh, the good practitioner is able to figure out what parts can get them to that awesome so that then they can make the internal connection of when they're declining. Mm, that's such a good way to look at it. I mean, it takes a little bit of emotional intelligence to kind of figure out, okay, well, they're not going to turn the TV off, like you're saying, but maybe they need this other thing. So you have to think about like what will resonate with that person. So um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely beautiful. Now going back to like immediate stuff for anxiety, cause a lot of yeah. people, especially around sleep, a lot of people, like if you've had a bad night's sleep, there's all this anticipatory anxiety about, oh my gosh, am I going to toss and turn all night? What can I do? So in a situation, and you already alluded to phosphorine and, and uh, herbs and things like that, but is there any like immediate quick fixes? Because that's what I think allopathic medicine offers for treatments. It's like, it's instantaneous. I don't have to do the work. So what are some natural, what I call them, like natural medicines or things that we can do in the moment? Like, okay, you, this can be super, you got a presentation, like you gave a talk yeah. today. Um, is it, do you take more of these oh, things? GABA. I mean, I, I didn't today. If I'm, if I'm under stage lights, I'll take yeah. a GABA. Uh, so I love pharma GABA. It's a fermented natural compound of GABA. And a lot of people like to say that, well, GABA can't cross the blood brain barrier. And I would agree with that, obviously. Uh, but GABA, when it's done in a chewable form, still has an influence on your enteric nervous system or the gut the gut influence or the second brain of the body, right? And so when your gut is in a symbiotic state of balanced gut bacteria, you're making more serotonin, you're making more GABA. And these are your inhibitory mellower outer responders to 
anxiety or stress. And when you're in a dysbiotic state, interestingly enough, you make more epinephrine. So you actually put out more adrenaline of this fight or flight chemical when your gut bacteria is off because you're trying to tell your immune system, it ain't right, like something's wrong. And so some people often, the root cause of their anxiety is some form of a pathogen or parasite in their gut. Um, I digress though. So GABA is, you know, an inhibitory compound that literally like takes the white knuckle effect off from stress. I find that to be the most immediate, but I do think of that as like you said, a downstream modulator. It's not a resolver, Um, but GABA in a chewable form does have an onset of like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, When Stella was first a toddler, I took GABA anytime I'd have to do like a mom and me class (laughs) or like go to Target or whatever, because I am a type A individual and I... I, it's like dogs. It's terrible to compare my daughter to a dog, but you know, we're all animals and they sense your energy. So if you present uptight, like, oh, I hope she behaves well, oh, like she could read that and she would just, you know, not be having it. But if I would take a GABA calm before those things and I'd be like, you beautiful child of God, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I swear. I mean, that really, and the GABA would impact me through my enteric nervous system, talking to my central nervous system, give me that chill, take out the tremor take out the shakiness, make me feel grounded. And then that transpires to my daughter feeling safe. Again, it comes back to safety. Um, Because I think that she would read my energy otherwise of that anxiety. Yeah. And um, so- This is not Phenibute, sorry, this is Pharmagaba. Yes, Mm Pharmagaba. Because a lot of people were from neuroscience was selling the Phenibute for a long time. That got pulled off the market recently. Right, and and again, Pharmagaba got the bad rep because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But I really find direct, personally and clinically direct influence, and it's via the enteric nervous system response. And um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the mechanisms of why keto is anti-anxiety. When ketones, which do cross our blood-brain barrier, they do a couple awesome things, but one of them is that they upregulate GABA expression. And so we get this like grounding mellow chill, and that's the mechanism that ketosis aids with seizure activity is also blunting or reducing the epinephrine surge. That's what's gonna be surging during like grand mal seizures. So there's there's definitely that dietary part, but as a light switch for bed, GABA calm, and um, I also love magnesium bisglycinate um, as well as myonositol. Mm-hmm. Those are, but those two I think of as more foundational tools versus yeah. like the light switch. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really. And so this is a lozenge. And how, sorry, how is there's all these different like uh, L theanine and sun theanine. So PharmaGaba mm-hmm. is just a brand. Yeah, it's a branded like sun theanine. So there's sun theanine is the patented form of L theanine in various supplements right? Right, right so right it's a it's a fermented form of gaba mm, okay mm-hmm. i didn't realize that i've never i mean we have a product with gaba in it but it doesn't have the pharma gaba so i just didn't know i even looked at that research and what's funny about that so i think datis karazian back in like the late i think once in 2008 2009 would would have practitioners if patients if their patients benefit benefited from gaba he would say oh you have a leaky blood brain barrier mm-hmm. right and I, so i was like well what is this like what's the molecular structure of gaba it's actually very small but it's polar but it's not like you would think that it's this big convoluted molecule but sure. it's actually like a very simple molecule so i've actually been kind of challenging that notion that it doesn't penetrate the blood brain barrier but then there is some interesting peripheral research like you talked about that when you take at oral gaba it actually uh, affects norepinephrine and epinephrine receptor sensitivity yes. desensitizes that peripherally so if you're having that anxious feeling it's going to diminish that those symptoms yeah. a little bit and then you know we also reduce those anxiety drivers on the times that we anticipate the more anticipatory distress right so like again big stage day i'm not going to be drinking coffee uh that's something that i i, I like coffee i enjoy doing fatty coffees and machos and whatnot but i pull caffeine out on a day that i know i'm i'm hardwired for more adrenaline mm. because why would i battle my you know my body's already going to be putting out more of that surge chemical and i know that that's going to interfere with my cognition it's going to interfere with my performance and you know really just my swag to be fair like to feel cool um, yeah. because i'm going to feel anxious um, and so I also remove the excitatory influencers and am really mindful like that would be a day I like to eat for instance a, a, a pretty hearty breakfast on a morning that I'm gonna lecture versus coming into it fasted mm-hmm. because fasted sometimes I get a little edgy agitated and um, I think it's because I run a little low leptin but uh, yeah I, I, I try to kind of remove and then and then layer and add as well interesting so when I present I'll do fasted mm-hmm. but I do notice like a little bit more anticip- anticipatory anxiety I'm like gosh why am I nervous I'm mean, normally not this nervous and I can snap out of it in like 30 seconds yeah. once I start talking but getting up there and I because I feel I always have this fear like 
if I have food, then I'm going to be drowsy. Brain I'm going to have a food coma. But yeah. I think if you push it out early enough, that mm-hmm. it probably could affect things. But what is it? I mean, you've talked about the lights and the stage. Is it just because there's a lot of people? Are you prone to that? I think it's just adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you seem like a natural. Exciting. I mean, I saw you. Was it Sunday when you spoke at KetoCon or Saturday or yeah. both or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I could never tell that you were nervous, but you, that's great. I mean, so here we go, like, you like fasting, intermittent fasting, I think is part of, you talk about in the book, and ketosis, but yet you're using food here now as a tool to mitigate a situation where you might experience it. So again, we're thinking dynamically, right? We have to understand the body, and then use these things selectively, which I think is important for people to... Yes, and and listen to our feedback of our body. Like I run more androgenic. Um, again, I'm this like hardwired type A person, right? So I find that sometimes, and and we can we should talk about leptin in a moment. But I find that if I'm wearing too many hats or I'm on a book deadline or whatever it is, that those are times that I have to shift my exercise. Also, like I won't do any intensity. I'm only walking and doing yoga during that time because. I'm already surging adrenaline and cortisol. So why would I provoke the activity? I want to get myself more parasympathetic. So things like walking, something with cadence versus hit is going to respond very differently in a high-stressed individual than an individual that is working in an office sedentary and at a moderate or consistent stress level. They're going to benefit from that shakeup. Uh, so we have to really think about some of these things and, and also the fact that we are dynamic. So you might type yourself at one one snapshot of your life, but then how does that shift you as your environment changes, your relationships change, and so many other factors? Mm, you mentioned the environment. So so you were at your peak of your anxiety here in Seattle. Yeah. Was it during the winter? It or was, yeah. Okay. And I also have rain on, so like ah. circulatory stuff, the bone chill, the, yeah. Mm. I, I My vitamin D was also low. I didn't mention that. So I'm sure that played a little bit of a role um, for certain, but uh, the the circulatory condition definitely hindered. I had a Siberian Husky at the time, and we would still do like five mile walking pretty regularly, but it 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 was bone chilling. Like I said, I didn't feel good coming back in from that. It was like always, I think, more of a stressor for my body. Interesting. So then coming back here, it's kind of a cloudy day. Does that affect things at yeah. all for you? I mean, feel my hands. Kind of, oh yeah. Okay. Right here I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah. I'm pretty chill like right now. But I mean, I. I probably would like, mar- I don't marble so bad here, but yeah, my, I got off the airport and I looked, showed my husband, I was like, here we are, we're happens. in the Pacific Northwest. Now that's a, mi- is it mild autoimmune? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So I have, ha- I have Hashimoto's as well, but yeah, so I'm a, I have like a positive ANA, uh, but um, yeah, the Raynaud's is, is the definitely environmental cue for sure. Mm. Yeah. It seems like people, places, and things can trigger all sorts of uh, different, different flare-ups. Uh, that's yeah. pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, so we talked about the pharmagaba, phosphorine. You mentioned DHA a few different times. Yeah. Um, but it, interestingly, I wouldn't peg you as like a androgenic type person. But so like you you tend to be like a little bit like your estrogen progesterone will be on the lower side and higher right. androgens. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So I think because of, again, just doing all the things, <laughs> the pregnenolone steel is real in me. <laughs> you know, there's this, all my hormone wants to become cortisol. It's like, I, I mean, I do, it's funny. I'll, I'll joke about my like email inbox and it's like, it's just like, there's these hurdles on this treadmill that I'm just like, boom, boom, <laughs> boom, just jumping over them. And um, it's, it's so much passion that keeps me going. And like I said, I now have enough tools in the tool belt to be resilient to that. But if I don't watch it, I'll, I'll get really quick. Like um, I'll notice cycle shortening. And that's when really when I was deep into keto postpartum, so let's say like six months postpartum, uh, is when I started to notice, and that's when I really started to research leptin deeply, uh, because I started to notice my cycle was becoming anovulatory, meaning I wasn't ovulating, a shorter cycle. And um, also was having other hormonal changes, getting more um, like chin acne response. And that was very new to me. And um, I started looking into leptin. And I had recently done a cardiometabolic panel and my leptin was at a two, which is quite low. Um, And, you know, again, you wouldn't because I'm not like super like look at your wife. She's super ripped. And I'm just like this like normal woman, whatever. Um, but I'm a low body fat still. And so when we are talking about leptin, you know, leptin's that hormone that regulates our satiety and it does dock to the hypothalamus. So when we're looking at that HPA axis fight or flight response, that's, I think a part of the keto high is that leptin is optimized and, um, we, 
pair leptin resistance with insulin resistance. So most people that have excessive body fat have not only insulin resistance, but also leptin resistance. So when they start metabolizing their endogenous fat stores and they practice things like intermittent fasting and a ketogenic diet that isn't over fat fed, they start to get nice leptin sensitivity. And I think that's a part of that keto high that we experience in the brain. And um, leptin, though, also is on, we have leptin receptors on our thyroid, on our ovaries for women, and in our, I mean, there's so many different receptor sites. And so I started to connect the dot of like, okay, I think that my leptin was firing super rad, right? And then because I'm a high stress individual, I tend to undereat. And it's not intentional calorie counting anything. It's just like I'm in clinic, I didn't stop to chew or breathe. Uh, I'm trying to do that four, seven, eight. Um, but I don't get hunger signals because I'm in keto. So I feel like what's food? I mean, I love food, I'm a foodie, but if I had to think of true hunger, I have to really rely on like my belly growling and being like, oh, I'm hungry. Um, and so I think what happens with me, being of a low body fat, I don't have the endogenous fat making the leptin. And if I'm not eating or if I'm doing a pure fast, I need to do fat fasts to keep my hormones regulated. And so, and what that does for me, as far as an autophagy process, we do still get autophagy from calorie restriction alone. So I'm not one of those, again, all or nothing of, if you had fat to your coffee, that's not a fast. I believe it's a level of a fast. It's not as extreme of a fast. And again, what level of fast do you need for your body? And for me, I need to eat copious amounts of fat to support and regulate my leptin. And then that's also when I kind of came into the findings of how leptin fluctuates with menstrual cycle and how you can incorporate carb cycling as a ketogenic female to support healthy female hormone. Mm, oh my gosh, so much to unpack that. That's amazing. No, it's question. really good. No, it's really, really good. But I, I want to just expand a little bit on that i'm using fat because you're low body fat so yeah. so yeah i think you know again people view this autophagy as like this the, the there's like this hard stop like if you just think about food autophagy stops yeah. but it's like if we just lose body fat or, and exercise there's human clinical studies to show that autophagy is enhanced so there's many different ways to go about this but i love that and so my wife for example yeah low body fat i do not promote you know prolonged fasting for her she's exercising anyway she's compressing her feeding window on a regular basis so I'm not worried about autophagy being, you know, dysfunctional or dysregulated. Right. Um, so anyway, really good point there. But uh, yeah, I, I think the carb cycling element as kind of a leptin recycler, is that mm -hmm. kind of Leptin reset, yeah. I love yeah. that. And, and so, I mean, I guess when it comes to carb cycling, I think I encourage people to be intuitive. I would love your approach. I mean, how yeah. we recommend doing it is on days where you're particularly intensely exercising, look at carbohydrates kind of like a performance enhancing drug, use it on that day. If you're sitting around traveling, does it make sense to do a carb cycling day? But is there a way that you probably talk about it in the book and I just haven't read it yet. Yeah. Is there like some structure for that? Yeah, so as far as for female hormone regulation, your, like I said, leptin levels are going to fluctuate based on your hormones. So your follicular hormone, your follicular stimulating hormone, your luteinizing hormone, there's gonna be different times when leptin is at higher demand. And so for women that are cycling and are experiencing either infertility or shortened cycles or have low leptin levels, and I have signs of low leptin as well, we can talk about that. Um, I recommend carb cycling for them about five days post ovulation which usually looks like day 18, 19 or 1920 for the individual. And what that means for me is having about three times of your normal intake of carb intake. So for me, I usually consume probably around average 40 grams of carbs, 40 to something grams of carbs a day. And so for a carb cycle, I might be doing like a 120. Um, I might only, I might cap at 90, but I want to at least hit double. Um, and the idea of a carb cycle for this leptin response is, like I said, leptin follows insulin, right? So leptin is actually insulinogenic to some level. So you need a little bit of an increase of insulin response to drive leptin refill if you're someone that runs low leptin. And the reason of that is, again, the body always wants to survive, right? So if your leptin levels are super low, that's telling the body that your hormone should be, your thyroid hormone should be suppressed and usually we see as leptin goes down so does free t3 um, and then we know like prolonged fasting or calorie restriction can increase reverse t3 so it has this influence of telling the body like 
eat, 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 not safe. And that's where that regulatory function of sexual hormone gets suppressed as well, right? So that's the impact on the female cycle is that if leptin declines, it's not going to give the feedback that we're regulated and that's going to interfere with the estrogen and progesterone cascades. Wow. So fascinating. You know, I've studied hyperleptinemia, but not the hypo side of things. So it's kind of interesting. But I mean, the leptin's got its hand in a bunch of different pots. I mean, if you look at like it's in interference and affecting the T regulatory cells and yes. the immune system, like I think when people hear leptin, they just think appetite and yeah. satiety and they yeah. think obesity, but there's like all these different things. I mean, some studies in metastatic breast cancer, individuals with high leptin levels have really poor survival rates. I mean, there's like depression, heart disease, yes. Hashimoto's and high, uh, thyroid issues, like you mentioned. I mean, it's so fascinating. Now, uh, question for you, did you retest your leptin? Is this something that you're like active? Yeah pursuing yeah yeah yeah. so now I hang at like an 8 to an 11 Um, and I tell women that um, if they're below a 6 that they and and they're doing a ketogenic diet or they're intermittent fasting that they need to rethink that philosophy because that's starting to get into the low zone Mm -hmm. Um, and so you know at a 6 is okay but I always say if you keep doing this in three to six months it might dip too low Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I've really seen successful outcomes with it. And men can run too low of leptin too, you know? And I think really, like you said, it's a bigger marker that really is, I think of it as a safety regulator because of the influence on the hypothalamus. And I think it either says, you know, turn up or turn down. And with men, I've seen, um, for instance, I had this, uh, high financial guy, high, high stress job, whatever, important person. Um, and uh, he was doing a lot of, uh, he's one of those like, if it's a biohack, I'm going to do it kind of guys, right? So he was doing ice baths, he was doing, which great, again, all these things, health supporting, but hormetic. So he was doing ice baths, he was doing uh, hot yoga, like extreme hot yoga, Bikram, high intensity interval training, both in the same day, of course. Um, and then I think maybe even sauna in there and then was trying to do a five day fast. And his uh, body fat percent was like already at like an eight or something, just super low. And I told him, he told, he shot me an email at like 3 a.m. on the third night and I already advised him not to do it. I was like, why? He's like, for autophagy. And I was like, but dude, right? It's like, again, this myopic thought process. I was like, but dude, I don't think you've compromised autophagy. Look mm-hmm. like you're, everything's looking good. Your micronutrient status looks good. Your body's functioning. So he, of course, got severe insomnia during the fast because his body's like, we're Freaking not out. safe. Yeah. What's <laughs> happening? Um, so severe insomnia where he said that he felt like uh, spiders were crawling on his skin, which is a big high epinephrine response, um, and had to have someone take him into a urgent care center on day three. Oh, and I'm like, right, again, but someone else that has body fat that isn't doing all of the things could successfully do a five-day fast supported with salt and you know watching their electrolytes and have wonderful outcomes. Mm-hmm. And it just depends on our start point. So key. I, I wish people hit the rewind button and listen to that again because, yeah, it's like not everyone needs to do the same therapies in sequence or with the intensity of each, right? You need to kind of think about your history, where you're coming from. And, and the parallel when I make this, people are probably bored of hearing it, but um, I don't know if you ever listened to Dave Ramsey. He's in Nashville. He has a financial radio show. Okay. And so everyone's coming at this from different levels. Some people are $100,000 in debt. Some people just want to pay off the $10,000 credit card, right? So he always asks, you know, what's your income? How many kids? you have and what's your debt right and so we don't really ask these questions when it comes to health it's kind of like well some people ask your age and your gender but it's not like well how long have you been eating every three hours right Right. that would kind of determine like maybe how intense should you consider this autophagy enhancement thing right like what's your leptin what's this so I think it's all individual. Now, question going back to the leptin testing. We know that leptin oscillates on a diurnal rhythm. It's kind of lowest, or I'm sorry, it's it's highest in the morning. Right. Like it starts to peak like around, right now if we film this around two or whatever, um, it's gonna start to rise and peak in the, in the night and then it'll be at its lowest point around noon. So do you recommend people kind of retest like at the same time? It should always be the same time. So I do it within a, a comprehensive panel that's a fasted panel. First thing in the morning. Uh, yes. mm-hmm. So it's consistent. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that's important. You know, some people say like, oh, I have low T. And it's like, well, when did you get your testosterone? Oh, it's like after work. You're like, right. well, when, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, but w- when was the other test? So right. I think this circadian influence, we talk about like chrono nutrition, but yes. when it comes to lab testing, like compare apples to apples mm-hmm. from a time Absolutely. standpoint. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Was it fed? Was it fasted? And so much more.
Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's funny. So speaking of like throwing things up, I did a bulletproof coffee test, um, blood work. Okay. Um, so it was obviously post meal, and it was interesting to see my lipid levels and triglycerides. Normally, my triglycerides fasted are like sixty, mm-hmm. and my triglycerides were like two ten. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> like, wow. I guess that's, that's a, a fat. that's a big delta right there uh-huh. swinging around. Um, gosh, we could talk all day. This is amazing, <laughs> Allie. Uh, we have a few final questions. Yeah. That we ask every guest, you know, and stuff like that. But um. You know, the recipes in the book look really flavorful, dynamic. There's a lot of like protein dishes and also vegetable dishes. A um, few final questions there. Ferments, yeah. you know, are you big into like having fermented food on a regular basis? Totally. In fact, I have a table in the book that talks about different strains in different probiotic foods. You know, of course, there's going to be some wild influence, but, you know, the different things that we're looking for as far as the lactobacillus versus bifidobacteria strains and a uh, big proponent of because the anti-anxiety diet is dairy free, of course, that pulls out like yogurt and kefir. Uh, and which some people may tolerate after the first 12 weeks of doing the program. I, I have to pull out dairy because there's just too much compelling studies on casein and the casomorphin impact and how that can interfere with our opioid receptors. So when we're talking about anxiety and mood stability, that just had yeah. to be a no. Yeah. yeah. And granted, again, getting back to individuality, uh, if you have compromised stomach acid, you're not going to break down casein as much, right? Also, is it A1 or A2? There's all these things. Um, but yes, I'm a huge fan of ferments. I uh, love pickled vegetables. I uh, do kombucha a little bit for the Saccharomyces. And um, I call probiotics nature's Prozac in the sense that I think we all need cultured foods within our diet. It's a really good way to inoculate and support. And if you don't tolerate a probiotic food, that's likely feedback that you have dysbiosis. So I talk about doing this probiotic challenge because a lot of people are curious and don't want to go to the level of maybe a stool test. Um, but they're like, you know, is this helping? Is this not? And so I think it's important to, to determine, you know, where's the playing field of your gut of those hundred trillion cells and how are they working in your body? Are they going to be enhanced with adding probiotic foods where you see less bloating and distension, better formed bowels, improvements of energy, cognitive function, sleep patterns, then likely you were maybe in a sterilized place. And that's a good thing to add higher amounts and maybe also strategic supplementation. Do you see no change? And then you're probably already in a symbiotic state, but you're likely getting some support immunologically, you know, reducing natural killer cells and all the beauty that come with benefit of probiotic and if you get a bad response you're probably in a dysbiotic state i've had someone say oh i took your probiotic and i felt like an atom bomb went off in my belly i was like yeah dude that means that the troops were not happy (laughs) like there was a battle when you took that active live active culture and so then that means we usually have to go through some form of a gut cleanse and plow the gut before we can reseed and um, i talk about strategy of how to do that that's awesome that's key. Um, it must be kind of funny for you to, because you got into this functional nutrition and functional medicine probably before keto, would you say? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then to see the keto movement, I mean, you see dairy free to people that are like diehard keto, but they're like, what's wrong with dairy? Like, right. I have cheese and everything. Like, right. it's kind of funny how certain subsets of dietary dogma, as we've been talking about, kind of don't hear one message that's so prevalent in like another conversation because right. in, in the functional medicine world like dairy corn gluten gmo like all this stuff is out like right. no question like if someone has a problem all those things are gone but it that didn't that message didn't get translated to the keto it crowd it definitely not. didn't with corn and erythritol and all the other things um i mean corn's everywhere in the keto space whether you think you're eating it or not I think a lot of people are being doused with corn. And in I what think, form? Uh, you know, just maltodextrin in a lot of products. Like I said, erythritol, sugar alcohols. They're corn derived. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Even, you know, even non GMO erythritol is still corn derived. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I find often when I'm running like an inflammatory food panel with someone that's not getting outcomes with keto that corn is a severe reaction. And then when we comb through, I mean, even in their citric acid and their bacon they're getting corn. So there is corn everywhere. Um, And so it's really awareness of that. Um, And uh, yeah, like you said, I, even with the dairy, right? I like can't even say no because I'm so fluid with my diet mentality that I'm like, but if it's A2 or if it's fermented, maybe there is a place for it. And that's where really we use a foundational approach to wring out the inflammation and then be able to hear the feedback, get out of that me- mediocrity and get into that thrive mode so that then you know individualized for your body what it needs, what it wants. And that's how you can kind of create your perfect plan. Mm-hmm. Someone with anxiety, what about ghee butter? 
Do, yeah, cool? so same thing. So I do ghee and actually even grass-fed whey at week mm. seven of the 12-week removal. And I give them strategic reintroduction to test as basically following the constructs of an elimination diet. So they'll increase the intake of that ingredient three days in a row, higher amounts every day, and look for a correlation of feedback within their body. If it's not clear, I'll have them do it for five days. And if there's no feedback, then probably check in the box that it's a good thing. Because like you said, ghee is free of casein. So again, to make it to make it myopic, to put a book out, you know, you have to give these constructs, but I try to then even within the chapter, a little bit unravel that and be like, but this is why, for instance, you want to incorporate grass-fed whey because it, it's casein-free if it's a good quality whey. Mm -hmm. If it's non-denatured, you're also getting those immunoglobulins. And if you have low secretory IgA, you might benefit more from having that grass-fed whey than from going no dairy. Uh, you might also benefit from the glutathione that you're getting from the grass-fed whey and the CLAs. So again, there's always some supportive element. And it's, it's coming back to the what's the mechanism of action? What does my body need? And what's going to harm it? And weighing that all out. Oh man, so many great points in there. And just to kind of highlight something that is tacitly implied, a lot of people when they buy whey, they don't realize there's isolates and concentrates yeah. and there's different subtypes of whey where it's coming from domestic or New Zealand. And right. so I think it's really important, like you said, I'm a big fan of the undenatured whey concentrate. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great raw material uh, vendor that we work with and I know you do as well. Yeah. You know, it's very important, but a lot of people just go, oh, I go to Costco, I just buy this whey protein. Right. You're like, well, what is it? You know, what form, like all the synthetic sweeteners, like what what else sacralose and aspartame what else is going on in there right uh, amazing so if someone is listening and you're like you got to get the book and cook this one recipe oh gosh. what what's like obviously you probably have your favorite and then people probably come to you and comment what's like a, a top recipe probably my matcha gelatin pudding and and you know there's so many good savory recipes as well but I think that this one's just a really funky fun one and um, it uses a can of full fat coconut milk of course one without any added guar, guar gum or anything no stabilizers so full fat coconut milk uh, lime juice and lime zest so we're looking for the bioflavonoids from the citrus there supporting the adrenals the tiny walnut glands that hold the most vitamin C in our body um, so we got the vitamin C from the lime in there and also the nice acid to offset the uh, grassiness of the matcha so it has matcha in there ceremonial grade matcha for L-theanine. So that's going to help to modulate our uh, brain chemistry, get us into that alpha brainwave space, which is where we see that concentration, focus, creativity, mellow. And um, it also has in there, let's see, coconut milk, lime, matcha, a little bit of honey, and then blackberries. Um, and then it uses gelatin, of course, to coagulate and stabilize and also add protein. And it's done in a blender. So it's like super easy. Mm -hmm. Dump, dump, dump. Rrr put it in ramekins and then you top it with blackberries. And it's a really wonderful like breakfast pudding or like just a midday snack. And um, the flavor profile is fantastic. That's awesome. It sounds like kids would like it too. Yeah, you know? totally, yeah. totally. Oh my gosh, the gummies and the gelatin stuff and the, yeah, my daughter loves that. Um, the, uh, I was gonna ask about, um, gosh, where was my, I was going with something along those lines. Um, uh, the the uh, the green tea. Uh, I think there's like mi green tea is kind of a mixed bag for some, certain people. Um, where do you find like a high quality green tea? So I well with matcha, which is basically going to be tea that's grown in shade and then the whole leaf ground. That, that's where we're going to get more of the expression of the L-theanine. So I'm someone that that if I'm going to do green tea, I'm just going to have matcha. So I, that's first kind of I guess caveat of a quality element. Uh, because there is so much controversy of the tea bags and, you know, chlorine being in your tea bags and whatnot, and not all of us carry a little tea ball, yeah. <laughs> stainless steel tea ball to, to dump our, our fresh matter in. So I love matcha. I think it's super convenient and easy. Mm -hmm. And um, there are different grades, which basically it's, it's just like anything like honey and maple and you know, meat where there's grade A and, and there's a ceremonial grade, which is, That's which is, quality. yeah, there's a, and then I'd go certified organic ceremonial grade matcha is okay. what I'd look for. That's good to look for. Yeah. I mean, I usually just buy the organic loose uh, leaf green tea yeah. and then there's all kinds of different subtypes underneath that. But my cousin was actually over here. He was just in Japan, uh -huh. brought back some, uh, just like a sencha. sencha I've had yeah. sencha, <laughs> but it tasted like a sencha I've never had before. Huh. It was so amazing. I've been trying to buy it online, but I haven't figured out a way to do that. Anyway, uh, the canned coconut 
coconut. So you mentioned the guar gum and all that, but do you worry about the BPA or BPA like compounds in like a canned? So the brand I use Alto is BPA free. It's uh, called Native Forest. Okay, my yeah. wife loves that one too. Yeah, but that, and it's I, called I, Simple because they have like four kinds. It's tricky, and it's oh. the simple, and it'll say no guar gum, and it's literally just coconut and water. So they do thin it a little bit, of course, and um, it is a BPA free can. So cool. better than know. yeah, yeah, because the there's a Thai Kitchen. I think is another brand yes. that's out there. Yeah, it's it's tough. We got to worry about all these little things, but it's I important, know. very important details. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so a few kind of more personal questions. Yeah. If you were stranded on a desert island, vitamin D, omega-3 is covered. What herb, nutrient, botanical, or food can you just not live without? And and maybe kind of the reason for this is because of its purported health benefits. Like what's just one thing you're like, ah, I couldn't. My house is burning down. It's coming with me. What is it? I think a ribeye. Nice. No <laughs> is that surprising? That. Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be a ribeye. And like it would, ha- but it'd have to be cooked. And I love there's something about a cast iron. Again, I like the crunch. Yeah. I needed my meat to be crunchy a little bit. Now, do you um, cook with butter or ghee or coconut? Well, so if I'm using a ribeye, I first sear it dry, and then I use butter in the pan towards the end process because I don't like to burn my butter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that ribeyes are fatty enough, even if grass fed, that they hold up fine in a cast iron. And my cast iron is always going to be coated with lard, yeah. um, you know, as we treat it after we wash it. So it's got a little bit of lard, I guess, in there, but there um, pretty much dry. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, there's a few brands out there. Like, uh, what, what's the what's the cast iron brand that you like? Lodge from Texas. Yeah. It's so cheap, too. It's like at all of the, you know, local Target, yeah, Walmart, whatever yeah, you name it. Mm-hmm. And it's nice. I mean, you can cook eggs in a cast iron and it's not, because a lot of people are still using these nonstick pans with yeah. Teflon. I'm like, even health, like people, like they're influencers. Yes. Yes. They're saying, hey guys, here's what we do on YouTube. And you're like, whoa, you're cookware, man. Yeah, like, I agree. So yeah, uh, cast iron's great. And we use stainless, but just coat it with butter too, sure. you know, yeah. for other things. And, awesome. the, and the steak... One of the reasons that might be interesting to listeners, you know, beyond the benefits of saturated fat and whatnot is amandamide talking about the endocannabinoid receptor system, right? So that's a form of a cannabinoid that's in red meat. And um, I think that's why, you know, we all feel so happy after brisket. Right? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's called amandamide, yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an endocannabinoid. Yeah. Okay. And it's upregulated with red meat consumption. Arachidonic acid converts into Triggers it. it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Isn't that? Yeah. So fascinating. I mean, again, we think arachidonic acid, inflammatory, bad. bad. And yeah. here we go. We're like, well, there's context to all this. Yes. Yeah. You know what's funny is bodybuilders used to take arachidonic acid supplementally hmm. to recover, to like drive inflammation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It that was like. Makes sense. I remember like when I, you know, in high school, I would go to GNC and then I would say, what do I need to like get bigger muscles? Yeah. Like, oh, you need this creatine and, and arachidonic acid. And then in college in biology, I was re- learning about the pro-inflammatory right. eicosanoid pathway. And I saw arachidonic acid. I was like, what was I doing taking this stuff? Right, and right. Maybe it could be because, you know, it also affects this uh, right. anandamide as well. Yes. Fascinating. Okay. So you got the books, you got a thriving practice, you got a great mind. Uh, we know successful people like have a set of rituals, like routines they do, probably to bookend their day before bed and, and in the morning. What are some things that you do in the first couple hours of your day that really kind of set up your day for success and mental clarity and have like such great energy? So I love to spend time with my daughter. I do take clients pretty early though. On a clinic day, I take a client at 8 a.m. and homegirl can sleep until 7.50. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I'll like race in. Sometimes I'll be logged into my EMR, my electronic medical record system, and um, then I'll like go grab her. Uh, But that's definitely like that, that oxytocin connection mama hug is an essential part of the day and um, I love to have my husband brings me fatty coffee every day and that's like my favorite way to start the day and for some reason it tastes better and it feels better when it's brought to you and you don't have to make it yourself Mm. I don't know Um, and uh, yeah I mean it's it's not that woo I take I have a a whole gamut of fasting supplements that I take and then layer things on throughout the day but um, I, I think it's just that the fatty coffee brought to me and my daughter and um, I don't have any time in the morning to do any form of movement that all comes in the like transition from clinic to then trying to be back into mom wife mode Mm -hmm. and that's when then I kind of reclaim my space and that's when I'll do like a yoga class or a a walk or something like that or I might even incorporate my daughter into passive movement and we'll go for a hike or something like that that's awesome yeah and there's a lot of that like in proximity to downtown Austin I didn't realize but that's really cool it's such an active city I mean people are up like running and 
That's really cool. I mean, it seems like you can exercise year round outdoors. Absolutely. Which is cool. Yeah. You know, unlike Seattle, we have to force it. I mean, we walk every day to school with my daughter and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And all these parents, we have a decent sized neighborhood. They're always driving. And it's like, this could be, it's so fun. My wife's on a scooter, like just push scooter. Uh-huh. My daughter's on a scooter. I ride my bike, but it's like, it's so fun for us to do that. Yeah. And I can't believe people just sit in the car and then they're just looking out the window and they're not getting their activity. Uh-huh. Anyway, uh, important to bond with your kid. As we say, I hear about their day and um, otherwise you just, yeah. Go through yeah, the motions mm-hmm. and then the years just go by super mm-hmm. fast. Um, so some people have a, this perception that like dietary change and health change is going to be like a grassroots bottom up, you know, kind of approach. And yeah. some people think it's like a top down policy level approach. And so I always like to ask people, yeah. like if you were in an elevator with a politician, a house yeah. member, Congress member or something like that, and they turned to you and said, you know, look, like how can we make people healthier? Like what's like the, the one thing? Stop subsidizing crap. crap crops. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stop creating affordable garbage. And I think that's because of our food subsidies right now. And if we could, you know, recalibrate that and distribute food subsidies to actual farmers or to smaller scale agriculture and decentralize the industrialized food system, that that would have one of the biggest impacts on our healthcare expense and whatnot. And it's that it comes back to that, right? You, you, you know, pay your grocery bills in your farmer's market today, or you pay your doctor tomorrow. And it's just such a frustration that we see all the time. The fact that a value meal is a dollar 99 and comprised of not just, you know, empty calories. I'm talking about deleterious harmful compounds and so we're driving chronic illness by allowing the tax the toxic substance control act as well as the subsidies of our crops of corn and soy no wasn't the intention initially of those subsidies like beneficial altruistic and now it's become like i don't know the history do you know the history on like why these subsidies for these crops became a thing well i know incentivizing short dwarf wheat was based on uh, World War II draft population not being able to fit the weight. There was more people underweight. And so we created or funded governmentally an obesogenic crop. So I would probably conceptualize that there's something like that, you know, like it was that these could feed people in, you know, low input and and whatnot. So I I don't know if that that was intentional weight gain and if there's a document there, but I do know that that is true with the short dwarf wheat. So it's pretty interesting. And, you know, that's that's the gluten that hit the market in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, and then just became ubiquitous. So... Here we are. Mm, it's scary. I mean, when you go home, do you go to the Midwest often? I do. Yeah. 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 It's just rows of corn, at least in yeah. Illinois. Wisconsin, I mean, I haven't been all over the state. Yeah. I haven't been west of Madison, but there's a lot. Like if you go, is it the 94, 91? I can't remember from Illinois to Wisconsin anyway. Um, yeah, there's a lot of corn in yeah. the Midwest. It's crazy. You know, if you live on the on the coast, you don't really right. see it. You're like, right. what are you talking about king corn until you actually go into the heart of the, the Midwest? You're oh, like, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of corn out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Allie, uh, amazing conversation. Thank you so much awesome. for coming. I hope you enjoy Seattle. Uh, and if folks want to like connect with your work, you know, what's the what's the best platform? Yeah, we keep it super simple. Everything's just Allie Miller RD. So the website's AllieMillerRD.com. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those places are at Allie Miller RD. To be fair, I only use Instagram. It just shuttles into there. So if you're gone, I'm always like, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, we just keep it all Allie Miller RD. And I have virtual programs and the books that we've discussed and all the things. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.